go. All right, so I've made an argument that maybe history doesn't help us all that much. As I pointed out, and I think H.W. Brands is a far brighter guy than I am, but you know, when he said there are winners and losers in war, I don't think that there are any more. I'm not sure that there's a clear winner or loser in a lot of wars that we engage in. I think they end in a draw, maybe. We recently opened up relations with Cuba, and basically that was part of the Cold War. I guess we sort of won the Cold War, although Cuba's still a communist country, 90 miles off the coast of the United States, and although we've normalized relations with them, which presents huge marketing opportunities, by the way, for the travel tourism industry and others, maybe cigars are going to come back from Cuba, and then a lot of people are looking forward to that, that that's not necessarily who's won in Cuba. We went in and we uh, fought the Bay of Pigs and clearly lost, but we kept missiles out of Cuba. I'm not sure who's won. And then I quoted Will William Durant, who says that the only lessons of history, he's a historian, are that people don't learn the lessons of history. But I do think that history is important, and I think understanding where you came from as a discipline is important, because I think that we do evolve, and understanding that evolution can be absolutely critical to a discipline. And so marketing as a discipline has evolved as well. And it's evolved in a way that you wouldn't recognize the early marketing studies as being marketing studies today, maybe, because they started at largely agricultural schools and they involved the study of moving products from farm to market. And so there are these logistics studies which are really boring. And there's a woman who has done this today in a sort of modern sense, in that she got on a tanker ship, and we'll talk about logistics and supply chain at the end of the semester, and I'll remind you of this then, and I'll probably have a test question on it, so you might want to write this down. It's called 90% of Everything, and the woman's name is Rose George. And what she does is she gets on a container ship in England and sails through uh, pirate waters and ends up in Singapore and then goes uh, back to England and writes this book about her journey. And that's sort of what the first marketing studies were about. It was about figuring out how we could move things efficiently. So Rose George, 90% of everything. And it's really kind of an interesting book. How many of you have seen the movie Captain Phillips? Quite a few of you. She was on a container ship that was owned, the, the shipping line that owns the, uh, the ship that was taken hostage in the movie portrayed by uh, Captain Phillips and Tom Hanks is what? Which shipping line is it? It's Maersk. They're the, one of the largest shipping container shipping lines in the world. They are a Scandinavian uh, shipping line, privately held, and it's the guy's first name. It's kind of like having a shipping line named Bob. It's his, it's his first name, it's not a last name. And so she gets on one of these, that was the USS Marist, Alabama, that was captive and hijacked and ultimately released. And she goes through those same waters. And she says, she starts out by asking people as she's going to get on this container ship, how much of the stuff do you think that you purchase every day arrived on a container ship? And most people say, oh, not very much. Maybe 10%, maybe five or less. Turns out it's a lot. It's 90% of everything. They catch fish off the coast of Scotland. They put that fish on a container ship, ship it to China where it's filleted, and then it's shipped back to Scotland because it's cheaper to do it that way than it is to hire Scotsmen to fillet the fish. Isn't that amazing? This device probably came on a container ship. What do you think it costs to ship it on a container ship? One device, pennies on the dollar. Pennies on the dollar, three cents to ship it from China on a container ship. Apple actually flies theirs over so that they get them here faster. 
but Samsung and a lot of the others, three cents is about what it costs to ship uh, an iPad across the ocean. Isn't that amazing? That's what shipping does. It allows, I mean, this world has really become much smaller. So these first studies in marketing were these sort of um, studies on how we get things from farm to market. And the first definition of marketing, so when we start thinking about academic disciplines, we start having to define what the domain of the discipline is. And the first definition of marketing, this, this definition is evolving, came out in 1935. So marketing as an academic study is relatively new. Historically, we didn't have departments of marketing, but the activity of marketing has ancient origins. We don't know where the first society started. We have evidence of it in the anthropological and archaeological record. Right? We have evidence of early primitive, we don't know which is the first one. The first set of people to come out of what we might call the primitive psyche and form a society. But once they did that, once they came out of this chaos, what Hobbes calls, in a book called Leviathan, the war of all against all. Once we came out of that and we started to organize into groups and societies, we began to market. People did things. How were the earliest societies organized in terms of this marketing activity? What were the primitive societies? How did they sustain themselves? How do primitive people sustain themselves? Hunting and gathering. So we start with a division of labor. What was that division of labor in the hunting and gathering society? How, what's the simplest way we can divide labor up? Hunters and gatherers. Hunters and gatherers. Who hunted? Men. Men who gathered. Men. Women. Right? That's a division of labor. We start marketing. So you start needing things, producing things so that the society can survive. And you're fortunate to live in Oklahoma because we have all of this history with our Native American culture that you can see and you can go, for example, the Chickasaw have a fantastic cultural center right off of I-35 in south uh, in south central Oklahoma. And you can see how they built uh, a society and tribes and things like that. And so we don't know where the first one was, but we do know that once we started to come together in groups, we started to have this activity that we now identify as marketing. But as an academic study, it's fairly new. And so that first definition, and you'll want to know this, the first definition of marketing is that marketing, and this is from the 1935 definition by the American Marketing Association, and they stole this definition, or actually they transformed from what was the Marketing Teachers Association to become the AMA, and they adopted that definition from the marketing, National Marketing Teachers Association. And it is marketing as the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producers to consumers. And I'll repeat it one more time, but I'm not going to do a whole lot because I'm recording so you can go back and you can watch the video if you don't get it all. <laughs> I don't want to bore you on the video too much for those people who are going to watch the video. People actually do watch the videos. It's surprising to me how many people actually watch my videos. Class, particularly around test time. The hits on my YouTube site seem to go way up right before the exam. So marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumer. Producers to consumer. 
Now, on Tuesday, I had you do an activity in which I asked you, how is this class different than every other class on a college campus that you have ever taken? And you all came up with some really wonderful answers. And in going back and looking at your papers from Tuesday and reviewing them, there are a couple of things that I think that we see that emerge. First of all, that marketing is really important. You all got that. It's a really important activity to our society. It allows us to get the things that we need and want in maybe an efficient way. The other thing that I think that you can tease out of those papers from Tuesday, you look really hard, is that you all already, when you walked in the door, knew something about marketing. Your first algebra class, when they asked you to solve for x, did you have any idea what you were doing? There's a great book that's come out. It's called Really you know, Stupid Answers or something that students give. And there's a math, and one of the earliest examples is a math quiz where it says solve for x, and the student circles x and says, there it is. It's a, no, it says find x, I'm sorry. And the student circles x and says, there it is. Find x. Did you know how to find x? No, but from the moment you were born, you've been marketed to. Even before you were born, we marketed to you. We sell items and things like that to your parents. Neonatal vitamins to make your pregnancy more successful. So you've been marketed to. And you have engaged from your earliest experiences in marketing. You cried to let your parents know you wanted something. You had a desire. Pretty basic, what is it? Most babies cry because they're what? They're hungry. They need something. They need a good. You know, they need the bottle. That's marketing, right? So you know something about this. Now this definition that I've given you, does that sound like what we think of as being marketing today? Marketing is the set of business activities that direct the good flow of goods and services from producers to consumers. What's wrong with that definition? It's not just business it's what? Not just business activities. It's not just businesses that use marketing. That's the first thing that's wrong with it. It's not just businesses that use marketing. Who else uses marketing? You all. I've suggested to you that your resume is what? A marketing document. What about nonprofits? Do nonprofits use marketing? To get donations. Absolutely. UCO is a governmental entity. Do we engage in marketing? Absolutely. They unveiled the new marketing campaign that they've developed for our university to try and convert students to get here. Why? Because we need students to pay tuition. Do we make a profit? We don't, right? Do you pay for all of the costs associated with your education here? When I first started teaching here at UCO, students paid about half the cost. This is my 19th year of teaching at the college level. 19 years. I started when I was 22. Um, my 19th year teaching. So, back then when I first started teaching, students paid for about 50% of the bill. Who paid the other 50%? The state of Oklahoma, through taxpayer dollars, paid the other. So we don't make a profit. Now it's become more that you're paying for more of it. You pay about 60 to 70 percent of the bill now, and the state still picks up. So we're not making a profit. But we still have to market, even though we're not making a profit, because we still rely on your tuition dollars 
for a big portion of our budget. So marketing is important even in that. So I think you can see what the problem with this original definition is of marketing in that it's far too limited. It limits it from a standpoint of limiting it to, to businesses, and it also limits it in terms of, you know, it's just basically about moving these goods like Rose George follows these containers on a ship from port to port. And marketing is about more than that. It's about more than just logistics and shipping. So if you look at your textbook's definition, the new definition of marketing, it's on page five. The American Marketing Association has combined its 2004 and 2007 definitions and now says that marketing is the activity for creating, communicating, delivering and exchanging offerings that benefit its customers, the organization, its stakeholders, and society at large. So now, this definition recognizes that it's not just necessarily businesses, but also organizations and individuals, and that there are more than just producers and customers. There are also other stakeholders. So if we think about, again, going back to the school, who are some of the other stakeholders that benefit from this institution's providing you an education? Community. The community. Which community? Uh, all of Oklahoma. All of Oklahoma. Or wherever we go. Or wherever you, we have students that go internationally. We have a lot. So, some, so maybe the world community is benefiting in some small way from the knowledge that students gain here as they go out. But certainly Oklahoma is benefiting. Who else benefits? Huh? Ourselves. You benefit, so you're you're basically like a customer. You get the tangible benefits. Who else benefits? So the community as a whole benefits. Businesses benefit. How do businesses benefit? More, uh, more money. You make more money, therefore you have more money to spend if you get a college education, and you can spend it with those businesses. How else does a business benefit? There are two ways. Huh? You have, yeah, you have knowledge. One of the things that businesses look at when they want to relocate to an area is what? The education level of the populace. Why is that important? What? Quality of employee. Unless you're flipping burgers at McDonald's, which doesn't take a lot of skill, most other things that we think of as being high income producing jobs require a heavy knowledge base. And so businesses benefit from having skilled workers and from having a populace that may have a higher income and can support purchasing their goods and services. How does the state of Oklahoma itself, the government, benefit from educating you? Increase tax revenue. Increase tax revenue. If you increase your earning potential, how does Oklahoma make its money? How does the state of Oklahoma make money? Tax. Right, there are three legs to the tax stool. If we think of, a, if we think of the tax base as, as being a stool, it's a three-legged stool. What are the three forms of taxes that we can collect? Income, what else? Property, Property. Sales. sales. If you get a higher education, do all three of those have the potential of going up? How so? You're, okay, your higher income, you're going to pay more in taxes. If you purchase more, you're going to pay more and pay more in sales tax. And then what? In property, if you develop property and build a bigger house, you're going to be what? Taxed more. So it's a benefit to society. So there's a stakeholder. There's something that I think should be added to the definition. And that's that Marketing is a pervasive, and this is a test question on the first exam. Marketing is a pervasive social activity. Marketing is a pervasive social activity. You cannot escape it and you constantly engage in it. 
even when you're not thinking about it, you're engaged in marketing. What did you do this morning when you got up? Eat. You what? Eat. You ate. That was good, so services that were brought, that's marketing. What else did you do? You got in the shower. Why'd you do that? You didn't want to stay. Yeah, you want people to like you. I noticed there's lots of people sitting around you. If you didn't take the shower, they might not sit around you. You did that so that you could, you know, be pleasant. That's marketing. You brushed your teeth. You combed your hair. You put on clothes. If you streak across campus, people have a tendency to think maybe you're not all there. They might not like you. So you put on clothes. That's a marketing, and that's that's an indication of your personality, isn't it? I don't see a lot of people dressed like Lady Gaga in here. Why? You want you want to fit in. You want to market yourself. You want to make friends, right? So you did all of these things to market yourself without even thinking. So it's a pervasive social activity. We do it even when we're really not thinking about it. It's not an activity that you can stand back from and decide you don't much like it, like a Picasso. You can stand back from the Picasso and decide that he was a nut. He was. Crazy. Look at his art. Horrific. No, I don't like it. Now, give me a Renoir or something like that and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll appreciate it. You can't do that with marketing. You can't stand back and decide, I'm not going to participate, because you're going to participate, whether you want to or not. And you do it even in unconscious ways. So it's a pervasive social activity. That's a good place to stop. We'll talk about theories of marketing, the philosophies of marketing next time. If you feel cheated because I'm letting you go a few minutes early, I'm starting to lose my voice, you let me